especially my son, before he goes off to college and, and plays what I now term as professional college football. Um, <laughs> Seriously, but it really yeah. was a blessing for me. And, um, and I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity. Welcome to Sports Spectrum, keeping Jesus in the sports conversation. Here's your host for today's show, former ESPN producer, Jason Romano. It's always great to have Matt Hasselbeck back here on Sports Spectrum. How are you, sir? Good to see you. Good morning, Jason. How you doing? I'm good. It's good to have you back on the show. I think the last time we had you on was a little over a year ago, and a lot has happened in the last year that we're going to kind of walk through and talk about. But I got to start with what happened most recently, and that is you got to coach your son, you got to win a state title, and you got to watch him go through this recruiting process to ultimately end up choosing UCLA. And oh, by the way, win the Gatorade Player of the Year in the state of Massachusetts. This has got to be pretty cool as a dad, because you walk through a lot of this yourself as a player, but to watch him do it, it's got to be pretty neat. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I don't even know where to start. We won the Super Bowl at Gillette Stadium. Uh, I was coaching the quarterbacks. My dad was coaching the tight ends. My dad played for the Patriots for a long time. Of course. Um, I sort of joked <laughs> after the game, like that's the first time I've ever won at Gillette. <laughs> so it was like really <laughs> special for my son Henry to get to do it with his teammates. At the high school that I went to, uh, the head coach there is a coach that was coaching there when I was in high school. So just just unbelievably special. And, um, you know, you mentioned a lot there, but like really – um, going back, like I was laid off at ESPN in June, yeah. totally blindsided by it, didn't expect it, uh, was definitely very disappointed about it. But it kind of opened this door for me to coach my son in his senior year and coach all his teammates and classmates, kids that, you know, basically are growing up the way I grew up. And, um, you know, I said to my wife during the season, I said, you know, as disappointed as I was that I got laid off, um, I feel like in a weird way, ESPN sort of made the decision that I would have never had the courage to make to sort of like walk away from the dream job and, um, I don't know, sort of invest in what's really going to matter long term. Um, not to discredit what I was doing, but like, I just don't know that you could put a price tag on the opportunity that, that I had to pour into the lives of the kids on our team and especially my son before he goes off to college and, and plays what I now term as professional college football. Um, <laughs> Seriously, but it really yeah. was a blessing for me. And, um, and I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity. Yeah. So what's, what's the couple of pillar moments that stand out from this year? Obviously, you know, watching your son play so well and, and winning in Gillette, by the way, that's got to be the coolest thing ever. Um, but then him choosing UCLA and kind of going through that recruiting process with him, you know, if you, if anybody followed you on Instagram or, or kind of connected, they'd see some of this kind of process happening, especially following Henry as well. Uh, and then to culminate it with like the player of the year in the state, like what, what, what are some of the couple of moments that you can kind of harken back on and remember pretty, pretty fondly? Yeah, I sort of feel like I'm still processing it a little bit. And I sort of feel like in my athletic career, you know, you look back and you see like God's at work here, you know, like, so like my son wasn't even a football player. Like he, he was a hockey player, lacrosse player that wanted to play football. Football was taken away from him freshman year. He broke his elbow, never, never got to play. Yeah. Um COVID was a thing, obviously. So like, anyway, so he was a four-star lacrosse recruit going on lacrosse recruiting visits because no one, literally nobody was recruiting him for football. And he was going through these proce this process and he committed to Maryland, to the University of Maryland, to head coach John Tillman, who's amazing. And this is what he said to coach Tillman at the time. My wife and I were there and he was like, coach, I want to commit to play lacrosse here at Maryland for you. I will not play lacrosse anywhere but here. But... um. I just want you to know up front, like if any college football programs, like big time college football programs recruit me to play football, I'm going to go do that. And literally, like I looked at my wife, we like made eye contact and had to like sort of like not laugh because he was the third string quarterback at his high school at the time, had never been the starting quarterback in high school and was transferring to a new high school uh, sort of because of my job situation. And that coach was amazing. And I think he instilled something in Henry at the time. And he was like, Henry, um, if that happens, 
Like we will be, me and my coaching staff will be your biggest fans. Like we will come to your first start. We will wear your jersey. And if this happens, it only um, it only validates who we think you are as an athlete. Um, and it, it just proves that we were recruiting the right kid all along. And I think like them breathing those like life-giving words into him gave him a lot of confidence. He goes into this new school again, like had not been the starting quarterback is the starting quarterback for the f- very first time last year as a mm. junior. And, uh, you know, so he was going to Maryland. Like, like that's what I have more Maryland gear than I have Boston college gear where I went. So <laughs> we were really thinking that. And then just through like, again, God writes stories better than any story we could write. He ends up changing his mind, getting recruited by a bunch of, I think he had maybe 30 division one offers, something like that. And uh, he committed to Michigan state. Michigan State eventually, that was going to be a good experience. Michigan State eventually loses their coaching staff. And just like really, really quick, you know, it's like musical chairs a little bit with the quarterback position. You know, uh, once Henry decided to go to Michigan State, other seats filled. Uh, Out of nowhere, like literally out of nowhere, UCLA, Chip Kelly came out out of really out of nowhere. And, um, And, you know, I guess sort of the rest is like part of, his history now, but it was as a dad and as a, as parents, you're sort of like, it can be nerve wracking. And again, I think we just sort of had this posture of like, God is in control. We've seen it time and time again in our own lives in our daughter's lives. Like he's going to write a story better than any story that we could sort of puppeteer. And, um, in so far, I mean, it, it's almost comical when you look back at this, like, five nine you know 149 pound lacrosse player who tells the head coach at maryland like yeah thanks but no thanks when i get my division one football offer like that's okay but it, it's it's super cool and he's worked really hard and we're really proud of him yeah uh ucla is pretty far from massachusetts where you live how's that gonna work out next next year I think the funny thing about like my kids, like me growing up as an NFL player and even the son of an NFL player, um, I feel like I always have stuff in common with kids who like grew up in the military. Like you're just sort of used to doing life wherever. Mm. Um, you know, I like Henry, just for the nature of, you know, he was born when I was playing for the Seahawks. Then I was with the Titans. Then I was at the Indianapolis Colts. Then we came here. I took this ESPN job. Like he's been to 10 different schools already, which is <laughs> just crazy. Like bad parenting probably. But I think it's developed like even in my girls, I see it like a resiliency and a toughness. And a, sure. um, maybe it's just what they think is normal. Like we've sort of told, told them like, oh, no, everybody does this. All kids have to do this. Um <laughs> But no, he's he's done a great job with it, and it was a little bit my experience. I did it as a younger kid. You know, my kids have had to do it in high school, and um, they've they've been they've been really great about it. So, uh, yeah, well, you know, UCLA, it's a direct flight from pretty much wherever you live. Yeah, Boston to LA, you get a lot of frequent flyer mileage miles right. going there. You and your wife. Um, this is gonna be a fun year for you. This is kind of cool. This parenting thing as you enter this. I'm I'm 50. I just turned 50 a couple months ago and I know you're 48, I think. Yeah. So we're in the same stage of life together with our kids that are kind of college aged. How's this time been for you as you kind of reflect and think about how quickly all of this is gone? I know that's how I think when I, I'm about to take my daughter back to school literally today. And I think about how quickly this is gone. Yeah. I mean, I remember back when they were young and we had three all in car seats, you know, and you were choosing the car you dro- drove by, you know, what can fit a rear facing, a uh, front facing and a booster seat all in the middle row. Like I, that, I remember those days. And, you know, those were like, that was kind of in the heart of my playing days with the, with the Seahawks, probably, probably my best days yeah. uh, as a player, but also the hardest. And, you know, like I remember everyone would say to me, like the days are long, but the years are fast in those. And, and I, and I agree with that. Um, but I just feel like as they're growing and growing up, I feel like I'm growing and growing up, you know, in different ways. And so like, I don't know, I, I don't think it's like, Hey, I've got all the answers as the parent and you guys need to learn from me. I think we're all learning. We're learning from each other. I'm pouring into them obviously, but I need to be getting poured into at the same time. And, 
Um, I just remember we, you know, when our oldest was born, she's now 22. When she was born, it was my first year as starter for the Seattle Seahawks. Um, our closest family member at the time was in like Chicago. Like we were <laughs> literally on our own. Yeah. And the nurses at the hospital were like, all right, you guys can go home now. And I was like, what? Like, we can't go home. Like, we don't know what to do with this baby. Like, we, we have no idea. Um, but it did go fast. It did go fast. And, um, you know, but it's been awesome. So great. That's good. Matt Hasselbeck's joining us here on Sports Spectrum. You mentioned back in June, kind of the blind side that took place with yourself and so many others that, that lost their job at ESPN. Take me back to that time a little bit. What was that? You mentioned being blindsided, but where was your mindset right before that? I mean, you, I assumed you were in the middle of June thinking I'm going to be back. We're going to get ready and it's another yeah. season. And then this happened. Yeah, no, literally I was working. Like I was working on a couple of projects in the off season. I'd done a really cool thing with Andy Reed and all of his, uh, all of his assistants that have gone on to win Super Bowls or were knocking at the door at Super Bowls, um, had a bunch of features that were going to air this year um during the nfl season i was literally like had just been in dallas doing this uh dak prescott thing with mike mccarthy and you know the uh that new offense that they were gonna do like i was so into it and very yeah. fired up about it and i don't know like i've been blindsided a bunch of times in football in my nfl career but you like you sort of expect it you know you go to play the new york giants like you expect Back in the day, like Michael Strahan's going to hit you when you're not looking, you know, it's just like yeah. DeMarcus Ware is going to hit you when you're not looking. Like I expect it. Um, I didn't expect it, but, um, but it's okay. Like I remember I got a call from my boss, uh, Seth Markman, and he was in Italy and he called me from Italy in the off season. I was like, Hmm, there must be bad news. And I didn't know if it was about me or about somebody else. Um, and he told me and it was like, okay, like, you know, um, Again, there's a, there's a plan here, and um, it was a good conversation. I was very grateful for the opportunity. Uh, you know, eight years before, he had called me out of the blue, offering me an opportunity to be on a show with Chris Berman and yeah. on the network that I, you know, like when I was growing up, we turned it on ESPN and we never changed the channel. Like that was the channel. Um, and so I was appreciative for the opportunity to do that, work with some great people. But again, like I don't think I – had any idea like what could be coming up next mm. having the opportunity to coach with my dad coach my son uh you know bring my high school the first state championship in a long long time it was uh it was really 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 special did you win a state championship when you were in high school he heck no we lost it <laughs> He lost it. Not so that I like, remember. You know, we were up 17 son. nothing against Brockton. They oh. had 18 second half points and beat us. Not that I remember. Oh, uh, sure. But, you know, it's funny. Like, I, I lost the Super Bowl uh, to the Pittsburgh Steelers, like the real Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. And we call the state championship the Super Bowl here in Massachusetts. And I lost to Brockton. And in a weird way, I kind of think they hurt equally. You know, it's like um, my my son runs indoor track. And so every time we're at these, in, there's a track meet tonight. Every track meet, I will see, you know, Brockton's really good at track. So we'll see guys from Brockton with their kids. And it's like every single track meet, I hear 18 second half points. <laughs> it's Gosh. Cool. Yeah. Always so, reminding you. But it's I think that's the beauty of high school sports. And like I've, I told the kids that I coach, and I don't know if they believe me, but like I've, I've played in, you know, played – I think big time college football. I played in the NFL for 18 years. I played in the Super Bowl, Pro Bowls, like NFC Championship games, like AFC Championship game, like all of it, right? And like I don't know that there's anything as cool and as special as high school football. Yeah. Doing it with the kids that you grew up with, kids that you go to school with, um it's really really special. And I don't know if they think I'm just saying that, but but it is true. So what I didn't know is that I think coaching um, that same level is equally is is uh, powerful, um, mm. and it's not just the fo football and the X's and O's. You know, we we had um, we had a few funerals this year during the season, and you know, just like all that stuff that's gonna last, that's gonna matter. Um, I can't even tell you like some of the stuff in my NFL career, but the high school stuff, you just you never forget it, and. Um, I don't know. It was the, I think that's what, one of the things I learned this year. That's cool. That's cool. What was the great lesson that God taught you about him 
as you're going through this, because like you said, a little blindsided, even though you played in a, in a career for so many years where you knew that not for long was what the NFL really stood for. Uh, but what is, when you really want to dig deep into the Lord here, what was the lesson he showed you? Well, I, I think, you know, I think I've probably said it already a couple of times here, but just that his plans are so much greater than our plans. And I'm, I'm a planner. Like I liked a game plan. I like a call sheet. I like four plays from the 20, four plays from the 15, four from the 10, four from the five, at least two point, at least two, two point conversions. My short yardage call. Like I like to plan. I like to know what's going on. I like to, before the game starts, call my fourth and one to win the game play. You know, when it's 72 degrees in an air conditioned room and there's no play clock, I like to do that ahead of time. And uh, I think I do that with a lot of things in life. And, you know, when this happened, it just was, you know, it's kind of like in the in the Bible, like really like in the Old Testament, like time after time after time, you know, people have to learn the lesson that they already learned and the people who came before them already learned and they should have learned from them. Yeah. And I think this was just like another example of like, hey, trust me. Like, trust me, like my plans are so much better than your plans. You just have to trust me. Now, they might not look anything like what your plans are, and it probably won't be a smooth road. But um, I think that was certainly a lesson. And I feel like I'm sort of in the middle of it still, too. You know, like this UCLA out there, like it's a little bit like, wait a second, you know, like you could be going to Boston College 15 minutes from home. You know, you could be going, whatever it is. But uh, yeah, there's there's a little bit of a. Uh, stretching and growing and and i don't know like even on our visit to ucla like his recruiting trip to ucla there were these little moments where i don't know it felt like a little bit of a god whisper where it's just like i got you hmm. like, trust me you know and um i don't know it's kind of exciting like tr truthfully like it's a little scary because you don't get to see behind the curtain but it's also kind of exciting yeah it's gonna be a lot of fun i like I think with our faith too, that's, that's the comfort, right? Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we can't see. We can't necessarily see down the road what's going to happen, but we can trust that God's going to kind of have us in his hands as we walk this. And that's always the hardest thing. Yeah. And I think for me professionally, like, I think there were some things that I knew, but I really like, they maybe had to get recentered a little bit, you know, like, you know, your value, you know, like sometimes like when you lose your job, you can feel like, okay, shoot, like what's my worth here? Okay. But like, but also like, what's my purpose? So I feel like the purpose part was really fulfilled for me. You know, the thing I probably struggled with was maybe like my value. Mm -hmm. Um, And then maybe another part that I question is like, okay, like, like what's my goal here in life? You know, like, like you hear people say like, what's the meaning of life? Or like, well, like, what's my goal? Like, what, what's, what am I really trying to attain? And I don't know. I just like feel like time after time after time, whether it was like a devotional I was reading or a song I was listening to or something like there was this devotional I read, I don't know, maybe a few days ago. And it was just talking about King Solomon and Ecclesiastes talking about like basically, um, you know, basically like things come and go. Right. You know, yeah. and, and and like what remains the same and and sort of like kingdom purposes remain the same. And so like sometimes I know for me get so like distracted and wrapped up in things that really ultimately aren't going to matter or have as much value. Um, you know, like I've got these like footballs and these trophies and all this stuff behind me. And usually when I jump on a zoom, it's just kind of where my computer is. But usually when I jump on, on a zoom, people are like, Oh, tell me about your footballs. Tell me about your favorite thing. And like, literally it's mostly junk. <laughs> like I, I honestly like yeah. even the cool stuff like cuz my dad had footballs like these and when I was growing up like these were the footballs that we played with in the driveway that like scuffed up and and it wasn't really like my dad's thing he was just like hey dad we need a football he'd be like here take this one and I'd be like oh we can't throw this he's like why not what are we going to do with that <laughs> and you know like I was just in Seattle this weekend at the Kraken Winter Classic against the Vegas Knights and I saw Marshawn Lynch yeah. and like it's a long story, but basically Marshawn's Beastquake football ended up in my daughter Mallory's bedroom. And he's wow. like, man, where's that football? And I'm like, 
honestly, dude, like that football has probably been in my dog's mouth, like in my swimming pool. Like he's quake football. Yeah, like yeah. probably. Like, you know, it just it's like it's just stuff. Like it doesn't really matter. You yeah. know, it's symbolic and it's cool, but like um the stuff that matters is sort of like the you know, I don't know. Like yeah, I, I had this, things. I yeah. had this, I had this talk with uh, my son at the end of his recruiting process, and he was like, "Hey, what do you think I should do? What school?" And he was down to two schools, and I said, "I don't think you can make a bad decision." He's like, "Really? Yeah, but what school?" And I was like, "No, really. Like, I don't think you can make a bad decision. The the bad decision would be making a bad decision if you're at that school on the West Coast or the East Coast. Like that. That's what it." That's what I care about. You know, that's what I want you to care about. And mm. I don't know. It's just like some of those like lasting – the perspective of something that's eternal is just way more important than sure. stuff. Do you think you'd ever want to broadcast again knowing that you were able to kind of see through this season of coaching? I know your son's in college now, so the coaching might might they be there. It might not be there. But do you think you'd want to get back into this? Yeah, I do. I think I'll be totally different though. Um, mm. if, and when I come back, like I, I would like to come back. I, so I got laid off. So there's technically like a term where I'm allowed to come back. I think it's right. after this year. Um, but yeah, I'll be, I'll be way more myself. And I think what I, what happened when I first started is I was really trying to be like prove that I had sort of done my homework with statistics and like 75% of the time, this quarterback, when he's wearing an away Jersey, like, but like as a player, I never ever cared about that. Like right. I really didn't. Like I remember Mike McCarthy was my quarterback coach, uh, my second year in green Bay and Brett Favre was the starting quarterback. And Mike was so into statistics. He had just come from Marty Schottenheimer and like he was very like he was a hard worker and he put all these numbers up on the board and the team to beat at the time was Tony Dungy's Tampa Bay Buccaneers and um and and he would write all these stats up on the board I and mean, it was like it was like a beautiful mind it was just unbelievable and I would write them down I would study them and Brett Favre would come in the room and he'd be like so <laughs> it was like yeah well I mean you know. Yeah, so – and Mike McCarthy did like a really good job. He was like, all right, fine, so. So he like took a different color Sharpie and he like went around and any time the percentage was over 37%, he was like, all right, we're going to care if it's over 37%. And uh, – but like let me tell you what happened. Yeah. It's almost never over 37%. Like the, in the NFL, guys do such a good job with tendency. Like it's almost never. So, like, basically, all this work that everyone put into, like, all the statistical analysis, like, it's important. I get it. But for Brett, for the quarterback, for me, like, so what? That's not what's really going to matter. What's really going to matter is, like, what I can do that literally, like, there aren't 30 other people on the planet that can do this. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. Like, that's a long way to just say, I think, in television – especially early on, I did a really bad job of caring so much about like stats. And stuff Impressing like people. You want to impress people. I don't know. It's but like, but now, now what I would do is I would just like, I think just say it straight up. Like, hold on playing with a sprained shoulder. If it's your left shoulder, it's, it's, it's not that difficult. It's not, let me tell you what is difficult sleeping that night and then playing the next game. You know, like, I don't know. That's a silly example, but like, um, I think it'd be fun, but could I like coach? Um, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm open to whatever at this point. Like no, that's I'm cool. A lot of things. That's good. I think that's a good way to approach it too. Just be open handed and let the Lord kind of lead you wherever he takes you. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions about those fleeting things and maybe even a few footballs that are behind you. Um, but we'll have some fun here as we wind down. Um, what game in your career have you been asked about the most when you run into people? Um, I would say it's probably a cross between maybe three games, either the Super Bowl against the Steelers, the Beast Quake game against the New Orleans Saints with Marshawn's run, or the Al Harris uh, wild card game in 03, the We Want the Ball, We're Going to Score game. Yeah. And the anniversary of that was recently and of that game. 
And like I, I sort of enjoy talking about all the games. Like I, I really do. And some are good memories, some are bad memories, uh, in a sense. But um, yeah, um, I would say those are the three that I get the most. But there's lessons learned in each, right? Like good and bad. You can take something away and share it with somebody else based upon whatever the experience was. I feel like the lessons learned are more in the bad games. And then the the <laughs> good games are more just like fun stories to tell. Um, but like just on the Al Harris game, you know, the, the Packers game, like I don't really regret anything about that day. Like nothing. That was probably yeah. one of the most fun games I've ever been in. Uh, I mean, I regret the audible that I chose to at the end that I threw the interception to Al Harris. But I also now know Al Harris. So I see the Dallas Cowboys and their DBs leading the league in pick sixes. And it's like, of course, like he's the most, I don't know, intelligent, uh, educated guesser DB yeah. that I've ever played against. And at the time, I don't think I really put him in that category. I just kind of like treated him as like number 31, you know, but like now looking into it. But um, but no, there was like just some great lessons in that. And like we lost we end, that ended our season in the wild card game in 03. The next year in 04, uh, our season ended last play of the game, wild card game against the greatest show on turf. I throw a pass in the end zone, a little too much heat on it, a little too low. That's that ends our season. But losing the way we did in 03 and 04. Uh, propelled us to go into the Super Bowl and be in the one seed and be in the starter in the Pro Bowl and like all the great things that happened in 05 yeah. because basically wasn't going to let it happen again. You know, and our strength coach at the time said, hey, guys, if you do what you've always done, you're going to be what you've always been. And that was like, a I don't know, it just hit right for me that year. It was like, I'm going to do everything different. I'm going to do everything a little bit better. I'm going to get 1% better in every area of my life. And let's all do that together. And like, we were on fire in 05, like on fire. Oh, yeah. Sean Alexander wins the MVP. We lost games that, you know, really the games we lost, the first game we lost, and then the last game we lost, but we were on fire. Um, anyway, it was just a cool lesson. I don't think it happens for us that, at least for me personally, had we not lost kind of like heartbreakers um, the two years prior, but it was, um, I don't know, there's like some fun stories of that year too and of that game, but. The Beastquake game, was that 09, right? Or was it 2010? It was 2010, 2010, yeah. Pete Carroll's first year in Seattle. Right. And that was the year we went seven and nine, won the division, and then the defending world champs, yes. Sean Payton, Drew Brees, they got to come all the way out to uh, Seattle, South Alaska, they said at the time, <laughs> to play us. <laughs> and, you know, the big talk was like, you don't even deserve to be in the playoffs. Right, it's seven and fair. nine record. Yeah. It's fair, right? That's fair. But I'll just tell you, like, Pete Carroll, our head coach, did such an amazing job of convincing us that we des we deserved it and we belong and that our record was not seven and nine. Our record was zero and zero, right? just like theirs. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, like it was just a great coaching effort. And it was really one of the best games that I had played, certainly that year. Weren't you hurt pretty badly going into that game or into yeah. that season? Yeah, I was, the whole year was tough. I had a broken wrist on my left hand. Like, it was a lot of stuff. But yeah. the funny part about it is that Pete didn't start me the week before. And then I opened that game. My first pass is intercepted. So, like, I'm literally, like, running off the sideline, running off the field to the sideline, thinking, like, oh, shoot, do I just come off at the 30 and not, like, pass Pete? in case he's going to bench me. And I remember jogging off the field being like, no, take it like a man, go over there, get benched, do it the right way. So I run right by Pete to get benched. And he like, he says something to me like, Hey, don't worry about that. We need you today. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, yeah. did, did not expect that. And, um, I don't know, the quarterback coach at the time, Jed Fish, like he said something positive to me. And I don't know, it was like, I think for the rest of that game, again, it was like a different me where I was like, cut it loose, have fun, no regrets, just be you and um, play aggressively. And like I said, it was one of the coolest games that I've ever been a part of. And um Probably the best run in NFL history, uh, the Marshawn Lynch run. So yep. 17 power. That was a cool one. That was a good. I still can't get over the fact that the ball was 
being licked by your dog and being played in the pool. Probably. The like, so like, so we win the game on Marshawn Lynch's like beast quake run and he celebrates and me and another teammate, Ben Obamano go get the ball. We're like, Hey, save this ball. That might be the greatest run in NFL history. So like, that's what we think. Well, somehow, some way Earl Thomas intercepts Drew Brees and we kneel the ball to end the game. Well, Marshawn put the ball back in the game because he wanted to like, close out the game with that ball but we just kneeled it like we never handed the ball off again so then after the game was over Marshawn like you know just takes off for the locker room and I have the ball in my hands my kids are all of a sudden on the field celebrating and right. you know I have three kids in two hands and really one hand at that time. <laughs> so I gave my daughter the ball and I didn't hear the story about what that ball was for for years really so um Crazy. Yeah, NFL Films did like this like, investigative thing, and there's literally a picture of me with my son Henry on my shoulders, my daughter Annabelle uh, holding my hand, and then my daughter Mallory holding holding the football. Um, yeah, just and somewhere stuff. somehow it ended up probably ended up in the. Bedroom there's a way to find out because I don't know if you know this, but every referee puts their like seal of approval is their number. Oh, I didn't the, know this. No, on the ball. Okay. So it used to be just like with a black Sharpie, they just like write it or they have like their own or a red Sharpie, like whatever their like signature was. And now like if, uh, if you're watching an NFL game now, you'll see the TV, like zoom in on the ball before the center grabs the ball. There's like this real official, like Wilson puts this nice thing on there. It's like engraved. It'll be like referee number 136 or whatever. Um, (laughs) it's like real official now, but yeah. Have you ever been awestruck meeting another athlete during your career? Yeah, for sure. Um, and sometimes no, and I should have been. Like, just because I, I don't know, being around sports my whole life. But I think when we traded for Jerry Rice when I was in Seattle, yes, that was probably the time where the whole locker room was like, oh my goodness, it's Jerry Rice. Like, I called him Mr. Rice. He was my starting Z receiver, X receiver. And I'd be like, uh, Mr. Rice, uh, you want to run a slant here? Or would you like to run a comeback? You know, just like, it just, I don't know. I'd heard so many stories about him and yeah. the offense. Like Mike Holmgren's offense was the Joe Montana, Steve Young offense. That was the Brett Favre offense. That was our offense in Seattle. And a lot of the times, like when we would coach a wide receiver, we would say, well, Jerry Rice and Joe Montana did this. So to then have him in the huddle was uh, was pretty cool. I came across a YouTube clip recently of a game with Seattle and Dallas on a Monday night where I think you guys ended up losing. Julius Jones had like a late touchdown or something, and they called a touchdown on a play that shouldn't have been a touchdown with Keyshawn. But Jerry Rice had like 150 yards receiving. It was like his best game catching balls from you. Uh, yeah, well, I sort of joke like I threw him touchdowns 209 and 211, I think. There you go. Uh, but I'll say this. I remember that game probably because we lost. Um, yeah. He had like one of the most egregious push offs in the end zone ever. <laughs> like I just kind of threw up the ball to him on a corner route and uh, he pushes off. But like no one was throwing flags on Mr. Rice. Like I, I don't know why. He just like, you know, Daryl Jackson would do like a little baby push off. You know, that's that's a. Uh, OPI, you know, offensive pass interference. Jerry yeah. Rice can literally like two hands, grab you, throw you, like, nah, no flag. <laughs> so I'm like, man, I should I should have been taking advantage of this. Uh, yeah, you should anyway. have been throwing it to him a little bit more often, right? Yeah, but he was great. You know, I, I was actually just with Steve Largent uh, at this at this Winter Classic. Another legend, you know, yeah. And, and we were talking about how Jerry Rice got to wear number 80. And like one of the things you love about Steve Largent is just how humble he is. And like Jerry Rice wanted to wear 80 and Steve Largent was like, yeah, I know it's retired, but like, don't worry about it. Like there aren't a lot of wide receivers that would do that. No. And, um, and what I was saying to, what I was saying to Mr. Largent about Mr. Rice was what I really appreciated about being his teammate is that, you know, as a quarterback, you go through the game and like, you kind of forget who's touched the ball. And instead of being like a diva or a whiner or complainer or powder or bad teammate, Jerry Rice had this like really awesome way of during a TV timeout or something, he grabbed me on the forearm, kind of give me like a little squeeze and he'd be like, Hey, um, I haven't had a touch yet. You know, I would feel a part of the game here if I got a touch, you know, like you don't have to force anything, but like 
I don't feel part of the game yet. If you could just give me a couple touches. And it was like, oh, yeah, my bad. Like, I wasn't even aware of that. And, like, so it didn't change everything, but it just gave me, like, a little nudge. And I just really, really appreciated that. And that was kind of early in my career as a starter. And so I was more like my antenna was up to it as I played with different guys in my career who were sort of star receivers, used to getting a lot of catches in practice, needed to feel a part of the game. And I ended my career in Indy with uh, like Reggie Wayne and T.Y. Hilton and those guys. And like they're used to getting the ball and like just understanding that like getting those guys touches makes them feel a part of the game because they're way out there and you're not necessarily always a part of it. Um, But if you kind of butter their bread a little bit um, early when you need them to kind of bail you out on third down or red zone or whatever – uh, they're going to feel more into the game, like in a flow and a rhythm. And I know as a quarterback, that's a thing. Yeah. Um, Jerry Rice taught me that as a wide receiver, that's a thing too. Did you ever pray during games? I remember asking Kirk Cousins this and I'm like, he's like, I kind of throughout the whole game. I'm just kind of like, all right, Lord, help me here. And then he kind of moves on to the, to the play. Was that ever a, th- a conscious thing for you when you were playing? hundred percent, like yeah. the whole time, like maybe more than ever. Um, you know, when the DeMar Hamlin thing happened last year, you know, I saw people, I wasn't on TV at the time, but I saw people on TV or social media talking about like, you know, we might have to pray. I'm like, I, like, I know people don't pray on TV. I know people don't like talk about it, but like when you're in an, where, when you're in an NFL locker room or on an NFL team, you probably pray more then than you ever have in your life. Like, Mm. um, you know, like just going back to my NFL career. You'd have a chapel or a mass or whatever the day of the game or the day before the game. You would pray uh, usually in the shower as a group of guys, like, you know, like as everyone's kind of getting ready not to be a distraction, kind of go in the shower and pray. You pray on every every single team I was ever on in 18 years in the NFL, five years in college, every single high school for four years. We'd pray before the game as a team corporately. The yeah. quarterback group or the quarterback center group or whoever was going out together in the tunnel, we would pray. We pray at the 50 yard line after the game with the other team. We would pray corporately as a team in the locker room, win or lose after the game. Hmm. I mean, it's just like all that. And that's not even talking about like when you're in the game uh, praying. But, um, you know, my prayer really was never like, God, I hope we win the game today. Like, I don't know that I've ever prayed that prayer. Um, my prayer was always, uh, something more along the lines of, you know, like there's a lot of stress, right. And so like yes. my, my prayer was like, Hey God, like, thank you for this opportunity. We have worked as hard as we could work this, this week preparing, you know, with trying to maximize the God given ability that you've given us. And we pray that like, um, your peace would be with us. We pray that we would play for you today to make you happy today. Not the thousands of people here watching or the millions watching at home or the coaches that are counting on us or even our families. Like we just pray that we would play for you and like the rest of it will take care of itself. You know, just give it our best. And we play, pray for protection yeah. um, for us and for the other team. And that was always the prayer and um, definitely a unifying feeling also. But, um, but yeah, to your question, uh, no doubt all the time, <laughs> all yeah. the time. I always find it interesting that prayer at the 50 coming together with other members of your own team and the team that you just wanted to crush during a game and settling down for two minutes or whatever it is. And just, you know, giving thanks. I, I think there's something beautiful about that, that you can go out there and want to, you know, kick San Francisco's tail but then after the game's over, you can get in a 50-yard line and whoever wants to join can just do that collectively. Yeah, no doubt. And I, I would probably, like, I never thought of it as, like, a scoreboard or counting numbers or whatever. But just looking back at our teams that I was on, you could probably equate the spiritual health of our team to the participation at the 50. You know, the chapel before the game or the chapel or the Bible study before final cuts. Always crowded, always Uh, taking a knee at the 50 win or lose. uh, Not always. And uh, so I'm, I'm appreciative. I definitely notice uh, even now just watching on television, but like to the third game that I had mentioned uh, the Super Bowl, like one, 
one thing about that Super Bowl that we lost to the Steelers the day before the game, uh, our quarterback coach, Jim Zorn, said to us, he like to the quarterbacks, he was like, man, how great has this journey been? Like, how, how good is God? Like, this journey has been amazing. And he said, you know, after the game tomorrow, win or lose, we're going to take a knee at the 50 and we're going to pray with the Steelers, like win or lose. And I was like, yeah, of course, definitely. Cause obviously, you know, we're going to probably win this game. Right. And yeah, definitely. And he just was so happy about the opportunity to pray at the end of the game as a thankfulness for the season. And I remember losing that game and I hadn't thought about that moment. I remember losing that game and all I wanted to do is go back into the locker room mm. and, uh, not only did I have to take a knee and wait for them to get done celebrating, like their confetti is falling. They're with their families on the field. Like there's this, and there's a picture of this, like myself, Sean Alexander, DJ Hackett, some of the guys on the team sitting there in obedience and sort of like deciding to pray when it is literally the last thing like you're in the mood to do. And every time I see that picture, I'm just kind of like, Yeah. Like, I remember if ever, if, if ever in my life, I was really like, no, I'm angry right now. Like, I, I, I don't understand this. I don't want to, you yeah. know, it was, it was probably, that's one of the moments. And, um, I don't know, there's just a great, there's a great lesson of obedience and I don't know there's lessons in it. And, uh, I think for me, um, you know, I, I still have the cleats that I wore, uh, in that game and they have like they literally have a little bit of the Steelers confetti left in them, you know, from walking on it. And it's a uh, it's yeah. tough, but it's also a good reminder of uh, of that moment. Yeah, it's still a moment that you. I mean, we don't have to go deep into the game, but like I always ask people, would you rather never play in a Super Bowl or play and lose? A hundred percent of them say I'd rather play and lose than never play in a Super Bowl, right? I heard Peyton Manning say the opposite. I heard him he? say that he would rather have never gotten there. Um, well, well, he's probably thinking about the Seahawks forty to eight or forty three well, to eight game. <laughs> well, I think it's different if you've already won one. Maybe you know. Oh uh, yeah, know. yeah. But no, I, I just think in general, though, the reward is kind of in the journey of it, you know. And like, I think one of the great things that I've learned from some of my coaches is that the scoreboard can kind of be a liar. You know, you could win a game and not play your best. You mm -hmm. could lose a game and give it everything you had and maximize the God-given ability that you have. And at the end of the day, I really think that's sort of the goal. You know, the, the goal is to do everything you can with everything you've got. Yeah. And, and if you do that, I don't think you'll ever be someone who sort of um, over tries when you're in a big game or plays to the level of your competition when you're in a, you know, playing a lesser opponent. Um, yeah. you know, it's sort of like a you versus you mentality and being the best that you can be. All right. My last question. Uh, I remember asking this to Luke McCown in solid July. great guy. Great Love guy. Luke. Yeah. Wonderful guy. And I, I told him, by the way, I said, you could be a broadcaster if you want. And he's like, I don't really have any interest. I'm like, you, you're so good. He could do a lot of, he could be a preacher. He's, uh, yes, yeah, that's probably great, will be that's, someday. That's a great family. But I asked him his favorite play. And he recalled a play and just knew it. And it was like, you know, terminology that I couldn't even comprehend. So I'm going to ask you the same question. Like in your career, it doesn't matter which team you were on. What's, what's your favorite play? Like when you knew that play was coming. Okay, here we go. Yeah. I mean, I have so many. Um, it's funny. Like if, if you were to ask my son this, because I put in a lot of our, like my favorite Seahawk plays on our high school team, you know, he would say this play called, we called it all pro. Um. Yeah, um, but the terminology is different, right? Like what I, what I was fascinated. Yeah, I had to make it like real simple for high school. Um, yeah. but it's exactly the same play. Like we would call it double right x short seventy two x shallow cross three jet seventy two x shallow cross. Like that's a that's a go to bread and butter play for mm. for Joe Montana, Steve Young, Mike Holmgren, Brett Favre, myself, many others, Donovan McNabb, uh, Patrick Mahomes, like. Michael Vick, like the, the list goes on and on of people who've kind of mastered that play. Um, it's got answers for everything. And what is the play? Describe it real quick. Like yeah. So the Z is on a post. You take that shot. If they give it to you, it's kind of like a three Oh pitch. You're okay. never really looking there unless like everything that they decide to do this. Now we're throwing a touchdown. 
Otherwise, it's, he's just kind of a love of the game route, L-O-G. You're running for the love of the game to help your teammates. Tight ends over the ball. He's setting a pick for his teammate, the ex-shallow cross, probably your best player. He's going to run a shallow cross. Um, there's, there's a right and a wrong way to run that route. And then backside, there's a 15-yard curl route. I call it a late route. And you're number three, you're number four in the progression, really. And right. you may never get the ball. But if the defense knows that the play is coming and they cover it the right way, then you will get the ball. And it's an easy 15-yard catch once you catch it. Now, you, there's no one around you when you catch that ball. So you could go do something with it. Um, Nate Burleson was great at running the shallow cross in Seattle. And people would see how fast he would get across. And then that late route was always open. And then your last option is this number five, a swing route, a wide route by the running back. And if you have to throw it to him, it's almost like the play didn't work. But if it does, if it does get to him, then now it's your running back one-on-one -on -one in space with one defender. And that's like as good as you could ever ask for on any running play. Right. So it's a seven-step drop running play in a sense. I love um, this. Yeah. And that's, that's the play. Did you ever have the deep uh, the three zero pitch and hit the home run? Oh, for sure. But the Mike Holmgren <laughs> rule was you could only do that inside the twenty yard line. Now yeah. I threw that ball in my first ever start in Seattle from the twenty one yard line, and got called to the principal's office the next day. Wow. It was an honest mistake. Like I had yeah. seen Brett Favre doing it from like the minus thirty yard line, so it was like, <laughs> no, what are you talking about? That's not the rule. And he yeah. was like, that's the rule. And I'm yeah. like, well, Brett said that's not the rule. And he's like, I don't care what Brett says. I'm the boss. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. My bad. Baptism you know? But the funny part about that is that I did that exact same thing to my son. He throws the post in the field to, you know, our best player. And I, you know, lose my mind a little bit. Not not really, but like, don't you know the rule? Don't you know After the rule? After a touchdown, right? After a touchdown. Yeah. But, you know, the funny thing, like, just about plays and a playbook yeah. And like faith, since, you know, we're on the sports spectrum, like I think when I was going through my NFL career, I was sort of like growing and learning the West Coast offense. I also was like growing and learning in my faith. And I really was kind of bad at both. Like I was I was OK at both, I should say. And there was a moment in my NFL career where we would get a new player all the time. Remember, we got this guy from Georgia, David Green. He was a quarterback, like greatest guy, good friend. And he'd be like, hey, what you read? How do you read 72X shell across? I'd be like, oh, it's like, listen, take the post, 3-0 pitch. But don't even worry about that. It's just a red zone thing. Delete that from your mind. Tight end, you're going to stare at him, but he's never going to get the ball. You're really throwing it to the shallow cross. Just stare at the tight end. It makes the shallow cross open. Okay, so he's really who the ball is going to eight out of ten times. Maybe seven out of ten times. If they do cover it, go right to the late. He'll be open 90% of the time. If the late's not open, just get it to the swing. It's like a run. Just get a completion. Give us second and five. Move on. Like, I could do that at, when David Green got to the Seahawks. I could do that like nothing. Right. At the same time, so I knew the playbook. At the same time, like the Bible, the playbook for life, I, was, I wasn't there yet. Like, I wasn't an all-pro player. I wasn't a Pro Bowl player. I was kind of like a second-year starter, sort of. Sure. You know, I'd be like, well, where does it say that in the Bible? I'd be like, mm, I don't know. Hey, Carl, team chaplain, where does it say that? Like, it, it was like I needed someone else to teach the playbook. And I think, like, you know, we're called to be disciple makers. Right. And I was really, really good at doing it with a young quarterback on the playbook, on Mike Holmgren's playbook. Um, but I, I just – I don't think I was there. And like, I think I've told you the story. Like I remember leaving a, a team Bible study one time with Trent Dilfer and uh, I was critical of what our team chaplain had taught on or how he had taught. And I said, uh, you know, he, uh, I said to Trent, we get in the elevator and I'm like, I'm like, you know, I don't know about that message. You know, he, the, the chaplain's never going to reach some of the guys on our team with a message like that. That's going to be over their heads or something like that. And, uh, and Trent, like, basically just shut me up. And he was like, it's not the chaplain's job to reach the, all the guys in our locker room. It's the chaplain's job to train you to reach all the guys in our locker room. And I was like, whoa, like, ding, ding, I don't ding. know why yeah. I didn't know that or think of it that way. 
at the time I thought like my role was to introduce everybody and connect everybody to the chaplain and invite them to chapel. Um, but that would have been like me telling our young quarterback, David Green, like, hey, hey, how do I run 72 X shallow cross? Oh, why don't you go talk to Coach Zorn? Go talk to uh, Mike Holmgren. Like, I, he doesn't have to do that. I can tell him. Right. And, you know, so like, you know, so like, I don't know, like, and that's, that's just sort of like when I hear a favorite play um, or I think about a favorite play that I've sort of like, I own it. I know it. Like, I know it inside and out. I could run it righty and lefty. Um, I also feel convicted on like what I, what I don't know in scripture that same way. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's a perfect way to wrap this up. And that's why I think we're a work in progress and always will be to the day we, to the day we move on to be with our Lord. So Matt Hasselbeck, thanks for coming back on, man. Always love talking with you. I look forward to doing it again and hopefully seeing you. Jason, uh, I got a question for you since you're always please. asking the questions. Favorite, yep. favorite song right now from you? My favorite song? Yeah, like what are you listening to? Like do you have a favorite song or a song you've heard I, recently? You're like, that's yeah. a good song. Or it's I, like top 10 anyway. So it's going to be faith-based uh, other than the Beatles, which is the only like real secular band that I listen to pretty frequently right now. Uh, it's this song called um, As Long As I'm Breathing, i Got a Reason to Praise. Have you heard that song, Praise the Lord? I think it's Brandon Lake sings okay. it with some of the eleva elevation guys. Okay. Um, it's Good. kind of upbeat and fast. It gets me right. going a little right. bit, and right. yeah, we pray. I like, add, I like to add new music to my. Uh, although yeah. I, I have that song, but okay. you have Spotify. I'll text you over the uh, the songs. So I don't listen. use Spotify. My some of my kids are mad at me for not being a Spotify person. So we might huh. be spot. We might be a Spotify family by the end of the week. Actually, <laughs> by um, this week, <laughs> this just came up. Actually, like there's a little group chat with the kids. Like, why are we not a Spotify family? And I'm like. <laughs> I, again technology i love um, it yeah okay. that's my song man that's right, my good. song and good. a lot of beatles so that's my band so All right. that's, that's good to fun. know that's so. good to know i appreciate that good yeah man you. thanks for asking me a question and thanks for okay. coming on the show i'll see you All soon right. thank you see ya hey thanks for watching our sports spectrum video for more conversations on the intersection of sports and faith check out our website sportspectrum.com